In the records of criminal history, the name Pablo Escobar looms large, a Colombian drug lord who rose to power in 1970s and 80s as the head of the Medellin cartel, one of the most powerful and ruthless criminal organizations in the history. Upon entering drug trade, he revolutionized the way drugs were distributed and transported. He was responsible for countless murder and used his power and wealth to corrupt politicians and law enforcement officials. Despite his ruthless tactics and violence, he had a Robin Hood-like image among the poor in Colombia. Escobar would fund public work and charitable causes. In a small town of Rio Negro, Colombia, a child opened his eyes on 1st December 1949. He was the third child of this humble family. His father, Abel de Jesús Darí Escobar, was a cattle farmer, and his mother, Hermilda Gaviria, was a teacher. They decided to move outside of Medellín to a village called Envigado to improve their livings and to avail better opportunities. Escobar reached an age where he started attending school but the family was struggling financially. That is why Escobar was more into earnings bugs rather than listening to boring lectures. He was looking for a quick way to earn, and at the fifth grade, he dropped out. Maybe he found a way to earn money, and that was selling fake diplomas. He and his cousin, Gustavo Gaviria, used to charge $200 per diploma, and that was his first ever illegal criminal activity. Now Escobar came to know that he can earn big and quick illegally. And that is why he started pursuing smuggling stereo equipment and selling stolen tombstones. These were his initial crimes prior entering into the world of drugs. Prior to getting involved in drugs, he used to steal cars, resulting in his first arrest in 1974. As he was well known, for illegal activities, he was contacted by a group of drug smugglers which was ran by Carlos Leder and George Young. Escobar noticed that there is a huge market for cocaine, and thanks to South America, specifically countries like Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, where coca cultivation and cocaine production were prevalent, Escobar would smuggle coca paste into Colombia, refine it, and would pay mules to smuggle it into the U.S. in their luggage or by swallowing condoms stuffed with cocaine. In the mid-1970s, he found the crime organization that later became known as the Medellin Cartel. If Escobar was the charismatic CEO, his cousin Gustavo Gaviria Rivero was its chief operating officer and the brains of the cartel. Gaviria Rivero developed and controlled the cartel's key smuggling routes, what would be called logistics, in the legitimate world of moving goods around the world. Escobar shipped much of the cartel's cocaine through the Caribbean, working with Carlos Leder and George Jung, who were organizing flights into South Florida through the Bahamas, which would be processed upon arrival in the United States. You can tell how dedicated Escobar was for this business. Escobar's sudden rise caught attention of the Colombian Security Service, leading to his arrest in May 1976, when a significant amount of cocaine was discovered in his car. He managed to influence the legal process. He was released. The following year, the agent who had arrested him was assassinated. Escobar's infiltration of the drug market created unprecedented demand for cocaine in America. Under his leadership, the Medellin cartel came to dominate the global cocaine trade, controlling over 80% of the cocaine shipped to America. This immense operation earned him an estimated $420 million a week and the nickname, the King of Cocaine. By the 1980s, the sheer volume of cocaine entering the U.S. was approximately 70 to 80 tins per month, made Escobar one of the 10 wealthiest people on the planet with an estimated net worth of around $30 billion, according to Forbes. At a time, later broke with Jung and took control of the tiny Bahamian island called Norman's Cay in 1979, using it as a base where planes would land in broad daylight on the 3,300-foot-long airstrip 
with loads of cocaine from Colombia. The cocaine was the transferred to small planes that could fly below U.S. radar and land on dirt roads and berms in Florida's Everglades. Such out-in-the-open smuggling wasn't going to last long. In 1982, the Bahamian government forced the traffickers off Norman's Cay. The South Florida Drug Task Force, a combination of agents from the DA, Customs, FBI and other government agencies along with the military, brought a screeching halt to the Colombia-Bahama-Florida route. But Gaviria Rivero, the mastermind cousin of Escobar, simply shifted the Medellin supply chain. He tapped legitimate cargo shipments, replacing the insulation in refrigerators and insides of TV sets from Panama with cocaine. They also mixed the highly soluble drug into Guatemalan fruit pulp, Ecuadorian cocoa, Chilean wine, and Peruvian dried fish. Even soaked it into blue jeans, which was removed by chemists upon arrival in the United States. He started moving cocaine through a poorest country situated in the Caribbean Sea instead of the populated dense areas of the Bahamas. Can you imagine profits were so big? Pilots made one-way trips to the Florida coast, dropping sacks of cocaine, ditching their planes in the sea, and then swimming to waiting ships. The cartel also began moving cocaine through Panama. From there, Mexican couriers would take it overland through Mexico and across the border into the U.S. That meant befriending Mexican smugglers, which helped launch the Sinaloa, Juarez, and Tampico cartels that have since turned Mexico into a virtual narco-state. Throughout it all, the Medellin Syndicate remained a decidedly wholesale organization. Escobar and his partners used a collection of distributors and retailers, from U.S. organized crime groups to small-town drug barons and Colombian emigres, to control the majority of the cocaine moving through southern Florida and over the Mexican border to the streets of America. The riches were vast. A kilo of cocaine might cost $1,000 to refine and up to $4,000 to smuggle to Miami, where Escobar's agents could sell it for $50,000 to $70,000 in the mid-1980s. At its peak, the Medellin Syndicate had five to seven flights a day into the US, Mexico, or the Caribbean, each carrying some 500 kilos of dope, say Pena and his DEA partner at the time, Steve Murphy. Tons of cocaine became billions in profits. Thank you.